Hello and welcome to episode five of season two of Guido Talks. We'll be bringing you the top stories and a bit behind those stories uh, of what's been appearing on the site this week. Uh, my name's Tom Harwood and today I'm joined by uh, Christian Cowley, reporter for Guido Forks and Guido Forks founder and editor Paul Staines. So without further ado, I suppose we should kick off with one of the biggest stories this week, and that is what's been happening north of the border in Scotland. After the R rate crept to the highest rate across the UK, the uh, doubling time of the virus is now the worst in Scotland, worse than any other part of the UK. And so this new raft of measures have been imposed, these sort of um, big anti-booze measures, particularly across the central belts, but also this, this two-week, very, very restrictive lockdown, closing pubs, closing indoor dining with alcohol, all of these things. Um, and it was quite interesting because somehow uh, the Guido Fawkes website was leaked the plans before anyone else. So we were able to get out um, these plans that we were fairly confident were true because we uh, we got the leak actually from someone who had been right in the past about some other plans in Scotland and so we uh, we put that up uh, and to, lo and behold four or five hours later Nicholas Sturgeon stands up in the Scottish Parliament to announce these restrictions um, although it's, it's interesting they're, they're incredibly focused on alcohol they're only going to last for two weeks, apart from in the central belt. So it will be interesting to see how much they actually affect things, because, of course, the, uh, the incubation period of the virus and the amount of time that it takes to translate cases into hospitalizations and, and deaths in some cases, is two weeks going to be long enough to keep those or to stop those from, from ticking up as well? I'm not so sure. Yeah, well, I think that's... They're basing it on the 14-day lag, aren't they? So they, they, you can't tell if it's worked or not unless you do two weeks. Uh, I mean, I'm not an epidemiologist, by the way. So I, I mean, that's my assumption. Isn't, isn't that the logic of it? Yes, but I mean, it's going to be a month until it affects death. So it, it's going to be a very strange situation whereby they'll lift all these restrictions as deaths are going up. Um, so I don't know if they'll actually keep them on a bit longer than they're saying now, and and what that's going to do to the to the freedom of the people of Scotland is is quite sad. Oh yeah, well, last the lockdown was going to be three weeks, we ended up in three months, didn't we? So uh, it's it's kind of I think the right to focus on the booze because you do notice as the night goes on that people get a bit more uh, touchy feely, shall we say? You know, unless unless inhibited. I mean, that's always been the way I've used booze is to reduce people's inhibitions, but that's probably my, uh, my technique we shouldn't really go into. So I don't know, because now that we've got table service at, at pubs and stuff, it, it, uh, you're not going to be really sort of leaning across the table onto anyone else. I don't see how booze is actually that different. I mean, of course, it's, it's very obvious how social distancing is impossible in a scene like a nightclub, which are sort of closed anyway. But where we're at table service, this was one, uh, one of the um, restrictions that Sweden brought in successfully, actually, at the start of the pandemic. It's, it's, it's often sort of this myth that Sweden did nothing at all. But no, one of the things that they mandated was table service, and that seems to have worked quite well. So I'm not sure if actually booze is going to do all that much. And of course, it just seems like this is a win for the puritanical prohibitionists uh, that have been pushing for, for minimum alcohol pricing and all that sort of thing in Scotland for many, many years now. I wouldn't say I'm mean, aligned with them, but I do like the table service. I, think, I feel it's, it's one welcome development. I hope that lingers on after the coronavirus is long gone. It's, it's ruined the pub experience. I'm, I'm interested in the long-term effect on this. Uh, you know, we know how much of a personality cult around Nicola Sturgeon there is north of the border. And if, if banning booze, uh, even that doesn't stop her popularity in Scotland, then, you know, we really are at North Korean levels of popularity uh, up there. It is interesting. Well, um, Professor John Curtis was on the PM programme on Radio 4 this week, sort of um, talking about how now we know that Scotland has potentially a worse outbreak of the virus than England, but also had harsher restrictions over the summer. And the difference in perception 
from the people of Scotland um, in terms of who's handled coronavirus well. It's extraordinary. I think Nicola Sturgeon has around a 70% approval rating in terms of how she's handled COVID. And objectively, by the data, you can see she's handled it worse than uh, the rest of the UK. It's worse in Scotland than the rest of the UK. And, and yet she has a 70% approval rating. It's extraordinary. Fur kilt, no knickers, so to speak. I, I would be, I'd be careful about throwing around uh, accusations of uh, uh, political leaders around the world. I think it's, I think some, some degree it's to do with demography and uh, cultural norms. You know, a lot of countries who have had, a lot of poor countries who have done nothing have, are having uh, less cases than, than uh, uh, rich, well-developed countries with big public health systems, which is a bit of a surprise. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we should dive too deep into the epidemiology of this, but I suppose that people in poor countries might have fewer underlying conditions, might have fewer old people because of the lack of the public health system in the first place. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a smaller vulnerable population to, for the virus to get because they have uh, sadly passed away from other means. But um, perhaps we should move away from um, being armchair epidemiologists and towards um, something that we probably have a little bit more expertise in, and that is the machinations of Downing Street. Um, Paul, what was the big announcement from them this week? Ah, well, the big announcement is, of course, we for years campaigned to have televised briefings for Downing Street, White House style, so that... Uh, readers and voters can see the news being made and demystify the lobby's Downing Street sources, which is usually uh, a load of people in a sweaty room asking the spokesman the same question in different ways. So uh, to our surprise, our pleasant surprise, after 10 years, Downing Street told us we've got our way and we are going to have them starting very soon, uh, televised press briefings. I think the reason Downing Street's changed its mind on this was the coronavirus briefings they realised that actually they could get their message out direct. And also, as it turned out, I was right. When people saw how the lobby asked its questions and how they preen and uh, you know, uh, go about trying to get extract information, the lobby's uh, methods will be seen for what they are and people will have a lower opinion of them and the government might get a chance of putting its message directly. Now, Allegra Stratton is an experienced journalist. She's worked for The Guardian for a long time. She switched to TV. She did uh, BBC Newsnight. Uh, she did uh, ITV News and last of all, Peston, before she went to work for Rishi Sunak. Um, she was always the favourite. I mean, she has, uh, there was an idea that they wanted a woman to present it uh, in this day and age. Everyone, all the best jobs seem to go to women. Um, the... Uh, the, the background she had for TV and the fact that she'd done an absolutely fantastic job for Rishi in holding, um, uh, pro creating his profile and spinning on his behalf. I mean, a, a few weeks ago, we ran a small story about Rishi Sunak delivering a piece of camera sat on a private jet. It actually wasn't a private jet. It was one of those RAF uh, BA-146s. And Allegra was on the phone to me, you know, because she was worried that it was going to proceed as um, he would be perceived as you know, a rich guy in his private jet. <laughs> and uh, and there's, uh, we won't go into those rumours about him and a helicopter from constituency to Westminster plan, you know, he's going to go to the best. I mean, I'm sure they're not true. Uh, and she was very forceful. She was demanding her to take it down. I, I know her a little from back in the day. And uh, we came to a compromise where we would explain correctly that it was an RAF plane, not his personal private jet. <laughs> and, um, and I joked to her that I'll see her when she settles into her new job, because um, she was always the favourite for this job. And she didn't, say, she, didn't, she didn't say, I don't know what you're talking about, or didn't deny it, or anything. She just, I think she hadn't actually made up her mind. And this was a few weeks ago. Uh, I think she, was, she knew this is going to be a very, very tough job. It's going to eat you up. You know, if, if it's going to be, she's, but she will have the advantage that she'll have to be in the room. You know, she can't answer the questions if she doesn't know the background discussions. So she's going to be close to the Prime Minister quite a lot, I think. Um, and she will be, as they say, as, as uh, I think in Hamilton, I know that uh, Tom will sing out the very bits. She will be in the room where the decisions are being made. And that's very alluring. So uh, good luck, Allegra. You've got a tough job. 
But if anyone can do it, she will keep the lobby, uh, you know, in check. Yeah, absolutely. I think from the, from the very start of this process, everyone was assuming it would be Allegra. And it was a little bit strange as to why it's taken this long for that decision to be made. Um, it seems that... Well, you had to turn it down first, didn't you? <laughs> yes. Yes, no, definitely. That's exactly what... I don't know. So I was talking to some of the people at the top of Downing Street a few weeks ago, and I was asking them about, you know, what's going on with the process. I mean... Um, have they got a shortlist or whatever? And I was told there was, there was a shortlist of five, and we run that, ran that on the site a, a couple of weeks ago. And also, I was told that they've started um, building the room, building the set for this. So I'm very excited to see what it's going to look like, how copy, how how, how similar it is. What's going that to be. set that um, we saw the CMO, the, you know, Witty and uh, Valence at? Was that not the set? I thought. No, I, thought I, I think I, I think we understand that it's going to be in the original lobby briefing room, which is in number nine Downing Street, and it's quite an odd setup because it's actually an old courtroom uh, that used to be used, uh, and so it's got a lot of odd, you know, you know, benches facing a, across from each other, and it, so it needs a, it needs properly decking out. I also seem to remember back when I used to go in, there's a hell of a lot of building work going on just outside the window. So hopefully that will come to an end. And we talk about how this will expose some of the more dastardly tactics of the lobby. The thing I was always amazed at uh, during the coronavirus TV briefings was actually they didn't do half of their usual rubbish. And even so, they were incredibly unpopular. Um, I, you, know, you, you can't get across the sort of petulant, childish uh, nonsense that they used to try and get the Prime Minister spokesperson, James Slack, to back into the corner of a room. I, I can't remember at one point they were spent, essentially spent an hour repeatedly asking whether the Prime Minister believes in basic human rights. <laughs> well, let's hope they don't live stream on a Friday and test the alarms when they're doing um, the briefings. <laughs> it was just a test <laughs> amazing um yeah apologies for that um interruption but um it does it does speak to the problems i suppose of doing any sort of live broadcast especially in a building that's not designed for it number nine downing street is not particularly designed for um live television broadcasts so i'm interested to see how they'll mock up the room how similar it will be to the white house press briefing room which i, I believe is a sort of more purpose-built facility than just a room in an old townhouse in a georgian street something i want to know is who is her substitute i mean she's she can't work every day. So surely she will some days presumably get flu, hopefully only flu, uh, or mm. something like that. And, and who will fill in? Uh, I can't see Lee Kane volunteering to get in the uh, front line. I actually bet 500 quid he wouldn't be the, uh, the uh, <laughs> spokesman. So that was the easiest uh, money I ever made. Oh, no, um, that wasn't the easiest money you made, Paul, because I, I thought you bet Tom. three times against me. <laughs> <laughs> I d I just didn't like the fact that you were like only the 10th last candidate. You know, I wanted to get you down into the 20s. <laughs> My problem, I was going to do the same, but I genuinely did not trust Tom to screw me out of a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is how you know it's not insider trading. Uh, just the lack of trust between the Keto Forks team. <laughs> Uh, right. Well, um, we should probably move on from that and go to Calgi. What was your favourite story this week? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lump a couple together because we've had a couple of wonderful loony left Corbyn Easter stories this week. The first one, uh, which did amazingly well on the website, was uh, uh, Claudia Webb, former Labour M MP, now independent after her expulsion last week. Uh, but she was in a select committee, the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, and essentially asked Dominic Raab whether Britain was... Sorry, Calgary, had... she'd been expelled. I think she was just knocked off the front bench, wasn't she? No, she'd she been suspended. Over... Suspended. Claudia Webb has been suspended over abuse claims. I stand correct. Now going, now going to correct. court. So uh, it's a fun subplot. Uh, but yeah, she, she essentially asked whether Britain uh, was a, as bad as Iran uh, in terms of um, you know, supplying arms abroad and destabilising and, 
you know, Dominic Raab basically said she had to, she better take a long, hard look in the mirror if if she thinks that Britain is funding sort of private militias and uh, funding terrorism in that well, way. She 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 hasn't backed down. She doubled down. Well, she doubled uh, down. She, t- on she tweeted at me after the story. Uh, she tweeted at the Guido Fox Twitter that you know Britain was. Arming the Saudis who were killing Yemeni Yemeni citizens, uh, civilians. Uh, so she's she's sticking to her guns. It's sticking to her guns over that. I mean, blimey! I mean, this is a state that literally sponsors terrorism. That had the worst terrorist in the world until just last year when he was airstriked by the Trump administration. It's just it always amazes me uh, how the Corbynista left can be so consistently not just wrong but downright offensive on foreign policy issues their their tendency to always side with britain's enemies or always give the benefit of the doubt to rogue states like russia iran uh, venezuela it's just incredible their consistency uh it was almost applaudable Uh, but then we also had uh zara sultana another fan favorite you know baby corbyn easter uh who uh you know put on a job advert for a part-time caseworker uh and we did the maths and she was only going to be paying this caseworker about 11 quid an hour and actually last year she was supporting mcdonald strikers in their desire to get 15 pounds an hour and we asked the question why did she support that when she's willing to pay her own staff a third less uh, than than what she's publicly campaigning for, uh, and I don't think she's addressed that in the same way Claudia Webb has doubled down on Twitter. I she accused it, it, it them of even... Donald of paying poverty wages, didn't she? But then she offered them less. <laughs> yeah, her, t- her, her, her tweet said something. Add up. Her tweet said something like, um, uh, "McDonald's workers on less than fifteen pounds an hour have to choose between heating and eating, and it's poverty pay and whatever." And then she pays her own staff less than that. It's extraordinary. Don't oh, McDonald's staff get a free lunch? <laughs> <laughs> now, one of the stories that we did this week that got the most pick up elsewhere and was um, subsequently run by a whole bunch of other news outlets and um, commented upon by um, actually Welsh Labour and the SNP uh, being um, particularly irate about it, uh, was a leak that uh, we published of internal Brexit planning documents um, that the Cabinet Office had been drawing up that had a number of interesting warnings on some of the pages. And we flagged up two of them on the website, which said, uh, make sure you don't share this information with the devolved assemblies you know keep this top secret do not tell the scottish government the welsh government the northern irish assembly uh what is going on um and obviously this this um very this was very annoying for uh the snp and for welsh labor but also very annoying for the cabinet office who were really not happy that we had leaked this uh this document and i i had some angry texts that uh evening but um but it is it's really obvious as to why it says that right i mean why would you share your sort of negotiation or or preparation plans with let's face it hostile actors domestically there's no way that the snp would use this information in good faith to prepare or plan they'd use it to score political points so it's really obvious as to why the government did it although they can't say that um so so this really uh, caused a lot of mischief all, all it's very, around really it's it's very obvious but at the same time uh very fun to uh to cause a bit of consternation and it was uh you know everyone and when i read that i thought it would i thought it would rile up all the right people and and it did and it got us a good few a good few headlines and uh you know that's that's what made judging, by the, judging by the inbox, a good few of our readers felt it was a, it was an undesirable story. They didn't want to I mean it's news. We, we can't suppress it. It's uh, mm. the fact that it was unhelpful to the government. I'm afraid people don't understand what we're about. We're about news, not not helping the government get through the day. It's very it's it's very rare that we're accused of sabotaging Brexit. 
but uh, or being on the side of the SNP. <laughs> being on the side. <laughs> I don't know, Paul. Your SNP braces today may make uh, may sway your allegiances. <laughs> uh, Julie Jean. <laughs> Julie Jean. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I do share one sympathy with one main policy for the SNP, which is, I think, a, a, a free and independent Scotland would be good for Scotland and good for England. But we'll move on because Tom will blow his top. I'm, I'm about to explode. So, so no, let, let's, let's move on. And um, Calgie, what else, what else did you like this week? Uh, There's a couple of, um, uh, a, a couple of uh, very internal House of Commons things, which I'm always very interested in. Um, we've got the fallout from the Margaret Ferrier uh, incident or, or Margaret Covid as Nicola Sturgeon has, has resorted to branding her during the press conferences uh, and that is because of a rising number of cases a couple of MPs are now having to self-isolate there are more cases of Covid uh, there's been a big new push to enforce coronavirus in Parliament you're having to wear face masks although I can uh, reveal that when I went in for lunch uh, the day after this uh, this edict was issued, almost no one was wearing face masks, almost no MPs were wearing face masks. Uh, so if you want another one rule for them, one rule for us angle, that's a very easy one. Uh, and uh, there's also these new Perspex screens being put in the Commons. Uh, and another uh, change the Commons is going to see, which isn't actually uh, it's uh, necessarily to do with COVID, but we also revealed that the new voting method uh, that has come about due to COVID, where MPs tap in with voting cards rather than it being uh, physically done by a clerk uh, in the voting lobbies, that's going to stay forever now. So a bit of modernisation uh, will hang about as a result of the changes seen around the COVID pandemic. Hmm. I mean, there was a little bit of modernisation in around 2014 or 15, where I think the clerks at the end of the voting lobbies stopped writing down names and started using iPads. Um, so this is, I suppose, a sort of, it's a gradual continuity uh, where we're going from handwritten <laughs> names to iPads to contactless. I'm you not sure you speak next. to someone who is still angry that John Burko removed the requirement for clerks of the House to wear wigs. Mm. Uh, so I'm not necessarily happy about the change. <laughs> I think it's pandering to modern sensibilities, but what can we do? Well, it's interesting because on the evening, uh, or it was Tuesday evening when uh, Lindsay Hoyle sent that message to all MPs. I think we were the first to get it up on the site um, quite quickly after it was sent out, um, that there would be a, a more enforcement of masks, that these Perspex screens would be going up, that they're really um, cracking down. The next day, not to be outdone, the uh, Speaker of the House of Lords, the Lord Speaker of the House of Lords, uh, Norman Fowler, started tweeting pictures of him wearing a mask and asking his noble colleagues to, to follow suit. So perhaps there's a little bit of rivalry there between the two Speakers of, of either house. Yeah, so they're going to try and... I thought Norman them. Fowler was... Norman Fowler was in his 70s, isn't it? I thought he was still self-isolating. So I was quite, quite impressed to see him uh, actually in Parliament. Well, he was um, yeah. he was down in the Isle of Wight for most of the pandemic and sort of trying to yeah. um, trying to chair stuff, um, but by Zoom, but sort of basically decided that that was impossible. And so when every when everyone sort of returned to work, he has now been every day sitting on the woolsack in the House of Lords managing stuff. But obviously, as as a, an elderly and vulnerable person to this uh, disease, he's very keen to make sure that everyone in Parliament follows the rules. Don't blame him. Look what I'm doing. No. <laughs> oh, wow. <clears throat> you, you do Caption, look like... The capture you contest is right there, ladies and gentlemen. Amazing. Paul, you look like one of the... So for, the for the advantage <laughs> of people who are, who are listening on the podcast rather than watching, <laughs> oh, God, gonna I, I'm going to attempt to describe what Paul is wearing. And I can only describe it as sort of like, like, like a glasses set that has something that looks a bit like a spade hanging down from it over... Paul's mouth and nose. Uh, if you if you imagine sort of a stripped back witch doctor from the sort of 1600s, one of these plague doctors with beaks, it's like he's got a beak that's sort of hanging over his nose 
and mouth yeah, um, it's, that, that, it's that's that, attached or, to or a, a glasses Lecter, frame. If, if Hannibal Lecter brought out a range of gimp masks, I think we're essentially yeah, somewhere uh, that, between those. The Hannibal, the Hannibal Lecter comment is the one I've heard the most, but it, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it goes down. I tell you, no one sits next to you on the airplane, so Air Lingus don't have to worry about uh, <laughs> me giving you or catching it really well. Of course, I, I mean, I, if, you, if anyone's I seen the... If anyone's seen the introduction scene to one of the new Bane films, one of the new like Batman Bane films, um, Bane obviously is the villain who wears a mask that looks a little bit like what you were just wearing there, Paul. Um, and the opening scene is where he sort of uh, hijacks an aeroplane and tears it in two. Um, and, and so I can, I can understand why people would be a bit wary sitting next to someone in, in quite such an auspicious mask uh, on an aeroplane. Do you know what? You know, it, it, it's, it's, it, it does look a bit uh, daunting, but actually it's not, it's not tight against your face. And, mm. and when I get back into, you know, wherever, I just put it under soapy water and clean it. And it's, I, I, it looks bad, but it's actually very comfortable. Fair. Anyway, Good. Well, sorry. Well, no, it's, it's <laughs> I could, I Sounds like most of my wardrobe, Tom, Paul. I mean, we're, <laughs> So we're, so we're always accused by people who write into the site about being sort of COVID bedwetters over masks, which, but, but I mean, to be honest, like if we're going to look at all of the different things, we're, I think as, as a team, we're pretty, we're, we're pretty opposed to the curfew. We're pretty supportive of masks. There, there, there are measures that we can support, I think, in this country that are very low cost um, and help keep stuff open. And then there are measures that are very high cost and questionable that I think it's right to question and oppose. Um, I don't, I don't, like, I don't like the masks. I don't, but I don't think they're a great loss of my liberty to put them on. I mean, mm. it's just, and I, I'm pretty certain that it stops your sneeze going on someone else. I'm not convinced that it actually protects you unless you've got a medical quality one. You know, the, the, the virus I think can get through. And there's some speculation that people who are catching the virus in aerosol form via their eyes mm. um the other thing is that apparently sort of uh, the the virulency of the virus is less if it comes through a mask sort of the the fewer droplets you get the wor the less bad a case you're likely to catch um but as our zoom <laughs> conversation is ticking down to its 40 Hell of a way limit, to end. i think we might have to just leave it there <laughs> Top quality, no expense spared, as always on Guido Talks. Thank you for watching. Cheers.